for 30, I don't see my face. It's actually a pleasant surprise. <laughs> oh, there I am. Hello, it's time uh, to start. The recording started. I'm uh, Victor Askin, and it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you uh, the, today's speaker, Professor Marina Gavrilova of the University of uh, uh, Calgary. Uh, you uh, uh, had her bio sketch. Her uh, website is definitely worth uh, visiting, at least to see how much somebody can achieve by a very young uh, age. Professor Julia Taylor hiding over there, and I attended a small but very pleasant conference on cognitive computing and cognitive informatics last July. And the best acquisition was meeting uh, Dr. Uh, Gavrilova. On top of everything else, on top of her obvious uh, uh, credentials, uh, she we share an alma mater. She graduated from uh, Moscow State University, uh, the premier institution which manages to crawl its way into the top 100 uh, universities in the world. I won't tell you how. Um, uh, and uh, mm, mm, uh, she attended it like 150 years after me, but we are alumni of the same university. Professor Gavrilova. Well, thank you very much. Professor Victor, for your introduction. It's really a true pleasure to be here today to share what I know and what I'm passionate about with all of you. And it's, I think we share at least one common denominator, which is a passion and interest in information security. And uh, my particular talk is related to two other very fascinating domains. One is biometric research that became very popular and very actively researched uh, domain uh, over the past 10 years. And second is machine intelligence and cognitive computing uh, that I think uh, are two of the areas that hold within itself paths to more discoveries and more advancement that computer science can do in the coming decade. So uh, with that, I would like to just briefly mention my background so you know a little bit more about me and what I do. I have uh, uh, co-created two uh, laboratories about 10 years ago at the University of Calgary. One is Biometric Technologies Lab, uh, which uh, is one of the first biometric technologies laboratories in Canada and have links to a number of research institutions and labs across the world that do similar research. And another one is Sparks Laboratory on Spatial Information and visualization. I also co-created International Journal of Transactions on Computational Sciences, which I have one copy here with you that I brought to Victor, and it will go to the library, as well at Purdue University. And uh, uh, over the last three years, I, uh, over, sorry, the past um, uh, seven years, I have written and co-authored three books, and they kind of go along uh, with my evolving research. And the first one was on image pattern recognition, a synthesis and analysis in biometrics. This is how our biometric laboratory was created uh, with the CFI, Canadian Foundation for Innovation grant. Uh, the next one is um, my passion and my PhD training. It's training in theoretical computation geometry with applications to Voronoi diagrams. I'm going to talk about Voronoi diagrams uh, very quickly. I will mention it's fascinating data structure because it has application in number of domains and the interesting things about it, just out of curiosity, for instance, if they looked at the pattern of the people walking in the crowd, apparently they walk along the Warner ages. If you look at the beehive or the uh, patterns of the uh, coloring of the giraffes, they create Voronoi cells. So they found in natures and constellations and they found in molecular structures in uh, uh, lipid bilayers, in some um, other chemical elements, they form the cells and the relationship between the atoms. So they exist in nature, and we know uh, quite uh, little about uh, them. So this is the second book. And the third one is just came out um, uh, last year. It's about my most recent work in the area of security, biometric security, multimodal biometrics and intelligence image processing for security systems. And once again, you can see the common theme combining uh, intelligent image process and security system and biometric research. 
And here is just a number of events that I'm involved in, aside from ICCI Conference on Cognitive Sciences, um, we are their Conference on Cyber Awards, and this year, uh, in 2014, I will be organizing the very first biometric workshop as part of this conference. Uh, and there is a conference on Warner Diagrams that I traditionally attend, and also information, uh, International Conference Computation Science, Computation Geometry, and Application Workshop that I run. So we talked with Victor about seminars that leave lasting impressions, seminars that just go uh, very excitingly but very quickly and you don't remember what they are about. And this is a message that I want you to come out with today. And I really like it. It's by George Bernard Shaw. It says, reasonable man adapts himself to his environment. An unreasonable man persists in attempting to adapt his environment to suit himself. Therefore, all progress depends on unreasonable men. So I really hope as a researcher, all of you unreasonable people. And this is what allows us to create and push the boundaries and do something that people did not think is possible five and ten years ago. And you will tell us about what happens to women also, right? <laughs> uh, the man here, or oh, the man, it's a great point and a great comment. Uh, from my perspective, I understand as a human being, a personality, a creative mind. Excellent. So, um, my son, working on his presentation, defined his understanding of mathematical logic and showed me it just before I was flying to Purdue. So I thought, if my son, who's 16, can define mathematical logic by himself, I can at least attempt to define computer science. I have more, a little bit more rights. And uh, essentially, it's, there's been a number of definitions of computer science, and the concept evolved over the years. Since it was created, first it was just supplementary field to mathematics and not something on the boundary between mathematics and physics. Uh, then it was uh, creating computer devices and designing the algorithms, definition of Donald uh, Knuth, whom I had the privilege to invite as a keynote speaker to one of the events, but he unfortunately refused uh, because he was definitely very, very old. Um, but I communicated with him. Uh, directly. So uh, he's created as a study of algorithms. And um, I think that, and then it was a paradigm towards uh, uh, computational intelligence, but I think from my perspective, it's not merely study of algorithms and the efficiency, but the knowledge discovery empowered by new ways of thinking. And those new ways of thinking is really what pushes the boundary, what opens the uh, door for us to create some new disciplines, some new sub-areas, sub-fields of the science, and to investigate even further. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk today a little bit about a couple of just new ideas. So essentially, it's a, it's a summary of where I think my research and my contribution to biometric research moves further from here, uh, uh, together with my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Roman Yimpolsky. We are promoting a new research domain called Artimetrics, Artificial Biometrics. Um, we, uh, in my biometric technologies lab, we work uh, on developing new architectures, uh, fuzzy multimodal, neural multimodal systems architectures. Uh, we would like to push forward a new paradigm, special temporal biometrics, social biometrics, context-based biometrics, uh, multimodal cancelable biometrics, and cognitive biometrics that we kind of try to uh, with, uh, I drafted those words and we try to move this forward with research in those uh, areas. And then there are also new challenges in the reality of uh, physio emotional privacy and predictability here at the Regina systems. And all of this hampers our uh, effects, as well as occasional cell phone calls, but that's okay. That's all right. Yeah, fully forgiven. Okay, uh, so these are our challenges. So I wanted to start with the question, what is security? Each of you can pick your own definition. Uh, Wikipedia defined as a state of being free from dangerous threat. Uh, it can be defined by safety of a state or organization against criminal activity. Uh, it's definitely an area of computer science and IT domain which has been on the rise. And uh, also, some of us very concerned about privacy can say it's a concept only existing in theory and not achievable. Uh, at all with the modern means of communication, regardless of you being connected or disconnected to the internet at the point. What is biometrics? 
Biometrics is a science which deals with automated recognition of individuals based on their biological and non-behavioral characteristics as uh, traditionally been defined. Uh, biometry is an area of mathematical statistical sciences and uh, aspect of biology uh, looks at uh, biological aspects of the human beings. And biometric system, essentially an automated pattern recognition system that can recognize, uh, which involves verification or identification of the person by determining authenticity of a special biological and behavioral characteristic. So how does it all come together to the purpose of security? Uh, aside from some of the uh, previous discoveries, in Mark Twain's book, Life on the Mississippi, a murderer was identified by the use of fingerprint um, comparison. Uh, Sir uh, Francis Galton, British anthropologist, who was also happened to be cousin of Charles Darwin, began his observation of fingerprints in 1880, and, and this is officially considered to be one of the starts of biometrics. But it was not up to around 1886, uh, uh, where um, a uh, French uh, police uh, detective and chief of police uh, in Paris, Alphonse Bertillon, created his system of body measurements used on criminals, where aside from fingerprint, he also measured such uh, elements as a, um, height, the weight, the uh, <coughs> symmetry and position of the eyes on the face, and you can see uh, a sketch to the right of number of different measurements taken for each of the person. It was all categorized and stored in the database, uh, obviously um, hand-recorded at this time, and then it's created the rise to modern system of classifying using biometric information for identifying a person. So the unimodal uh, system architecture will normally involve initial data, uh, in this particular case of an eyes, uh, being uh, sens um, sensed and uh, image obtained by the sensor module uh, then there will be, a, after quick quality check, whether it's sufficient or not for recognition, we can go to the uh, feature extraction. Uh, then we can also enroll the data that we received in the system database. A matching module will compare the features or the original raw data to the data stored in the database. And then decision module will make identification or verification decision, which involves two things. A verification is one-to-one -one comparison. So essentially, we're going to, a person enrolls in the database with the photographs and says and types his name in. The system will say, yes, this name corresponds to this picture in the database. This is an easy comparison. And identification one-to-many, the person comes in with his face without the database. It can be covert or avert observation of a person in the crowd. The photograph is taken. We want to identify what, uh, who, he is. Apparently, as you know, the Facebook came out this year with this technology to try to identify people based on their faces across the different pictures, looking at the environment, looking at their friends, and it's uh, created quite a lot of controversy and discussions in the scientific world and the privacy and security conference uh, where I was um, invited as a uh, keynote speaker in uh, Victoria Tribute um, Privacy and Security Conference this year. There was a whole um, session devoted to discussion of this important subject and what application it has on lives of everybody. So in order to validate traditionally how well the system performs, there are a number of uh, uh, characteristics that been, um, and criteria that's been uh, created. For biometric systems, some of the common ones is going to be false accept rate or FIR, a probability of imposter being accepted as a genuine individual, false reject rate, FRR, probability of genuine individual being rejected as an imposter. All of these are uh, very well known definitions in the biometric. There, most of the systems, commercial systems, or little databases, or the developments of the uh, companies will be validated against. In addition to those two very important characteristics, we have RCA CMC curve, receiver operating characteristics. Curve plots false acceptance rate against corresponding false rejection rate to understand the pattern or see the dynamics of the relationship. And uh, CMC cumulative match characteristic curve shows the chance of correct identification within the top trend match result. So if we do have out of the database of 1 million, we have about 1% or 0.001% of the top matches then this will tell us if we 
definitely are not going to find the correct person within this top niche. And then we can uh, analyze statistical data even further. We can look at general accept rate, fraction of general score exceeding the predefined threshold, and general reject rate, the fraction of Moser score below the predefined threshold in order to validate how reliable our system is. So these are major characteristics and major um, um, factors that affect the performance of the system. The, those characteristics really depends on the data that you're working with. And in biometric lab, we've worked with a variety of different types of biometric data. We've worked with initially uh, uh, physiological characteristics, physiological biometrics, such as fingerprint, face, ear, vein patterns, um, iris. Then we worked with behavioral biometrics, such as voice and signature and the typing patterns and the gait. And uh, as I will tell in the next slide, we're starting to work with newer biometrics that also came into the play. But for traditional biometrics that we're working with, the expectations are right now very, very high. Essentially, it's expected that the uh, false accept rate uh, will be below 0.1%, that the uh, false rejection rate will be below 0.1%. They are not symmetrically, uh, not symmetric. They, they, they can differ based on the security settings type of the biometric you use or uh, architecture that you use as well. And um, essentially, in order to achieve very, very high, above 99% accuracy of the performance of the overall system, we can use a number of tricks and improvements. And some of those relate to the algorithm itself. Some of those relate to the uh, super powerful computers that we can use in parallel distributed processing. And some of those relate to the fairly new concept of multimodal biometric or using more than a single source of information. And then performing decision making, combining information fusion using those different uh, data inputs. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So uh, in biometric image processing, it's one of the fields that links me to my background uh, in PhD in computational uh, geometry and image processing. We can perform the whole bunch of different operations, such as digitalization, compression, enhancement, segmentation, feature measurement, image representation, image model, and even design special methodologies. And there are tons of different methods that we can use. We can use filtering, smoothing, registration, hierarchical, morphologi uh, morphological, or multidimensional models, deterministic, phase geometric, and statistical um, approaches to model and compare images and classification, design pattern analysis, and even machine learning in order to learn the patterns and compare them uh, better. So all of those create fairly interesting individual projects. But what, where our overall research in, in my lab takes me uh, right now is towards really um, the synergy of biometric and machine intelligence. So on the left right here, we can see uh, physiological and behavioral uh, biometrics as a two basic types of biometrics, uh, biometric data that we can process. And we can apply supervised or unsupervised learning in order to learn and represent those models. We can use cognitive system architecture, physiologic system architecture, multimodal system architecture in order to uh, perform the match and make a conclusion about identification and verification. Where we can draw on more data and more um, factors is right here. So first of all, we have uh, cyber world and virtual reality, which is representation of so-called alter ego of the person. It's a second nature or it's part of the uh, personal identity. And within these cyber worlds, we can try to identify through the avatars, the owners, through the owner avatars, and try to identify the behavior, normal, abnormal behavior, the patterns, and actors in this play. Uh, this given a rise of this little sub-area of research that we call art, art symmetrics. Uh, then we have social networks, and I call it big data. 
and the big data under this big data what i understand is everything which is collected about you exists about you out there in the databases in the customer service in the uh, workplace or in personal space but not necessarily online uh, the first one social networks is all the social information that you have on twitter on facebook on blogs uh, on your uploaded pictures that you upload and share and uh, on the web so and this data provides vast vast materials for understanding even more about human nature human communication about ways to identify people and about um, uh, such uh, phenomena as um, even twitter or wikipedia or facebook uh, things that did not exist uh, 20 years ago but things that we increasingly rely on for our communication and information in the modern age from there from taking and studying all of this data we can um, identify normal versus abnormal behavior which can help with security concerns and patterns uh, whether it's been online or being when you physically cross the boundary uh, or border of some countries and in addition to traditional identification verification we can perform additional special uh, temporal analysis and which gives rise of a term that i call special temporal <coughs> biometrics uh, we can have context-based biometric, which means a biometric that looks not only at something which is obvious, but auxiliary, supplementary information, which can be found, such as time of day of the picture of taken, for instance, in the gate or the background where the person was walking for the gate recognition or, or surveillance video, or the typical behavior of the person, uh, whether he's following the habit, whether he's not following the habits. And this can be used as part of either very serious security system or it can be used to perform additional social and collaborative research. Uh, we, even without all this complexity, we have enough misconceptions about biometrics and those problems still remain up to now. Their so-called Hollywood uh, perception of biometrics that is uh, given to all of us. And uh, for instance, it's for Hollywood face recognition, we can see a uh, police guy in the helicopter trying to chase the car on the road with high, uh, going 100, 150 miles per hour. And he managed to snap his picture from the um, right up there from the helicopter on the move, immediately ident uh, identify, recognize the person in the database, tied into super, super database who knows who everyone is and ha makes no mistakes. And right after it, he is successful in finding the vulnerability of this person or making an arrest. Obviously, this is science fiction. This is not what really happens. And there are tons of even tiny uh, issues and problems that people can solve uh, within this area. And it can keep them occupied for years and years of research. That's why the face recognition still extremely actively research domain in biometric even after 20 years of very very big successes in the field hollywood dna has another misconception uh, assumes access to super database has everyone dna is automatically rapidly processes a sample and makes no mistakes as well so this shows you that even with the simplest individual biometric process and there is still some challenges and issue but what we're trying to look at globally and um, uh, what identified our count current research at the biometric technologies lab at the university of calgary are the number of following um, research directions so we're looking at intelligent image processing that i briefly outlined before how to identify the boundary how do we perform image segmentation how do we compare them how do we uh, deal with changes in illumination, in position, in rotation, the distance from the face, how do we deal with occlusion, how do we deal with process of aging, how do we deal with process of emotion recognition on the person, or how emotions change our perception of the person or face recognition. So there's a whole bunch of issues rolled into one right here, and how uh, getting the system to learn and to look at the patterns and understand the patterns and train the system on patterns can help to deal with those issues. Uh, the learning techniques that we're using, uh, we were one of the first to use neural network for multimodal biometric system, uh, and uh, the research was published in Science, Science Digest and a uh, number of um, very good journals in addition to that. 
And uh, we're looking at support vector machine, we're looking at topological and Borner based clustering, evolutionary compute and cognitive system architecture, fuzzy uh, logic as some of the techniques and approaches that can help us to design smarter and better systems. We also, aside from traditional types of biometrics, we also look at emergent biometrics such as infrared EEG, blood flow. Uh, we still investigate the problem of synthetic biometrics. Uh, it's an inverse biometric problem where instead of trying to identify person by biometric, we try to recreate the patterns of the person and learn from that. Uh, and then, we, as I mentioned before, there is a new research direction which we call uh, social biometrics, uh, web-based biometrics, uh, uh, special temporal biometrics, and cyber war security using biometrics, RT metrics, that also allow us in combination to devise new ways to process this massive data and identify the person or the traits. Uh, here is just a quick look at the settings in the biometric technology laboratory. Uh, and right after that, this, uh, I want to bring you back to the basics. This is one of the tools that we use to devise um, new clustering uh, methods. Of, um, published it in IEEE Robotics and Automation uh, magazine a few years back. This was also a topic of invited uh, uh, research lecture at Microsoft Research that um, uh, was also videotaped a few years back. So we're talking about Warner diagram and Delaunay triangulation, and right here on the left, we can see that it's defined as partitioning of the space onto polygonal uh, regions, uh, such a way that each distance from um, each side to any point within the region will be no f uh, further than from any other side. So essentially, the region around the Warner side determines the closest neighborhood of the points. We can imagine each of those sites, in this particular case, an example of molecules or circles, but we can imagine uh, each of the sites being, um, uh, for instance, cellular or um, antenna on transmitting device. Uh, it can be bank that you try to uh, locate and you locate it anywhere within the space and you need to find the nearest or the closest neighbor. And in order to find the closest neighbor in this particular case, regardless of where you lo located, for instance, you're located right here where my mouse shows the closest neighbor will be one to which region you belong, so this will be the closest site. Uh, we use this in order to find uh, the optimal path uh, with specified clearance in the GIS uh, system. Uh, we uh, use it to find patterns in the um, end relationship in the data that we can collect. Uh, we can use it in order to build triangulation and look at clustering uh, on the number of points, mm -hmm. and we can use it to look at the molecular structure of the molecules, and all of this represent number of different applied domains where we use this methodology. In terms of, in terms of, um, back here. Um, this is, uh, this resolution is not quite pulling off the video that I have right here, but essentially it's a, a dynamic algorithm that builds uh, the clustering uh, for the given set of points using uh, Warner diagrams and the outcome will be shown in a second with all the scholars. So what we used it, uh, initially is we used it in order to identify patterns in the fingerprints. We applied it to the fingerprint um, synthesis and fingerprint recognition analysis. And as it appeared to be the fingerprint structure, especially identifying the minutiae points, uh, is very well represented by Delaunay triangulation, which is a dual to the Warner diagram. Um, it's built in such a way that for every two Warner diagram sites, if there is an edge between them, they will be connected by the edge in the Delaunay triangulation. So it's a dual uh, 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 data structure to the Warner diagram. And what it does allows us to do, it allows to introduce a number of very uh, flexible measures 
For instance, we can model elastic deformations of the fingerprints very easily. We can model nonlinear deformations using this data structure. We can, when we compare the two of these data sets, we can compare regardless of the slight imprecisions in the angle and the distance and the area. So there is a number of parameters that allows us to compare the fingerprints using this particular approach, avoiding an error that some of the other methods do. And when we created this, um, um, we also got, got quite a large number of citations on this work using Warner Diagram for fingerprint recognition. Uh, we got uh, essentially the highest recognition rate for the fingerprint available this time. It's been used uh, in a number of places, this particular method. Uh, so this is just a quick example of how the outcome looks. You have, you have a fingerprint, uh, there is, um, the system will identify either that's, um, but in this particular case, uh, it was a little movie done by National uh, Film Foundation Canada uh, and talks about uh, Warner diagrams and his history of research and then how we research uh, bi uh, biometrics in this lab. Okay, a couple of other um, applications uh, of the same approach to modern biometrics. We can use um, thermal images, for instance, for emotion recognition of the human, and emotion recognition provides huge hints on the state of the person, on whether he is uh, calm or whether he is um, um, nervous. For the security applications, the emotion recognition in this particular case, and these images are provided by uh, Pavlidis report, um, it shows that if person is nervous because he needs to lie, his blood flow rate will increase under the figure number D, and it will point out to abnormality or abnormal reaction to the question. Uh, in synthesis and analysis biometric, here's a couple of more examples of synthesized iris that we create a synthetic fingerprints and synthetic online signature processing, as well as synthetic fingerprints. Uh, now coming uh, down to one more application of the neural uh, network or machine intelligence for biometric, we can design a system that will learn from multiple traits. So it's going to learn based on face, topology of the face, and some additional feature vectors or even infrared information about the face. Uh, it's going to be, the information is going to be acquired for a number of different users. First, uh, it's going to extract the features uh, and create the features set. Uh, then it will choose and analyze the best set of feature vectors depending on the type of biometric you use. And then it will create a chaotic associ uh, associative memory uh, with obtained vectors, train the neural network to recognize the common patterns. And once again, we're getting very high degree of precision of recognition using this approach to machine learning. Uh, another direction that I mentioned before is uh, using auxiliary or additional information, context-based information. And um, one of my master's students did a successful research on using social context for gate recognition. So essentially, instead of uh, trying to make the language run faster or make it um, more sophisticated, we simply use additional information from the video. Uh, as you can see in this particular example, there's tons of information that can be uh, obtained from here. We can see it's a day. We can see the person is walking by outside. We can even identify the surrounding or the building behind the person walking. So all of this, in addition to the gate itself, which might not be perfect, increases significantly recognition rates. And so is in those particular examples. We also worry about security. And... Uh, there is a fairly interesting uh, concept that's been paid more and more attention recently. It's called cancelable biometrics. And cancelable biometric is a question that five, ten years ago I was used to ask my graduate students saying that what's going to happen if your biometric data has been stolen. Uh, if your password is stolen, it's very unfortunate, but if you discover it, you can replace it. Uh, you can change the security system, uh, settings on your system and essentially uh, you can deal with it. What happens if your fingerprint image is stolen? Somebody has your device and uses your fingerprint image. In fact, we run this um, uh, as, um, I believe, Apple um, 
uh, release a new uh, phone, iPhone, which uses fingerprint uh, for uh, login, the Discovery Channel uh, Canada with Jay Ingram ran a segment, a recorded segment in our biometric technologies lab trying to break the uh, security that is provided by using fingerprint. And in this particular segment, uh, they managed to create a fake uh, fingerprint using a jello and feed it to uh, the uh, device that uh, simulates the, the fingerprint sensor, which is a uh, uh, commercial fingerprint sensor. And uh, after the third attempt, it's got 80% um, or 70% uh, match of the person and allowed uh, intruder to get in. And it's, it's literally took you know, ten, 10 minutes to create it. So with advancement of technology at the same time with a huge imperfection of the technology, what can be done to mitigate those security threats? So we cannot uh, change the biometric, but what we can do is we can use only fraction of the information available in the fingerprint when we create any kind of password which are biometric based. This allows us to extract the features or we can uh, mix up this information, we can use apply encryption to this information, we can transform it, take it, uh, convert it to another dimension, take it in another form. And this will allow us, even if the original will be compromised, to recreate another biometric based password because we're only using fractional information. So the key is never to store raw data in the full form because in this particular case, if it gets compromised, there's no way to recover it. You're not going to cut off your hand or, you know, go to plastic surgery to change your face if that happens. But the key is really to use a number of security measures to protect it. So we're working in this domain as well. And then we did a number of very interesting applications to um, connect and identify virtual roommates. Uh, using um, uh, uh, virtual uh, um, biometric recognition, security recognition, and look at little bit futuristic, but nevertheless very, very uh, real way of uh, robot recognition, understanding, and under robots we understand bots, we understand software, we understand virtual agents that exist in virtual spaces. Um, and uh, we did a special issue in um, IEEE RAM magazine on robotics uh, and biometrics, and there was a large number of very high-quality submissions in this domain from people working in both uh, uh, machine intelligence and uh, robot authentication and navigation and um, artificial intelligence domains, because this is becoming another concern for security. So now, in the remaining uh, 12 minutes, I'm going to talk in a little bit more depth about two last um, kind of fairly big areas and directions of our research. So one is multimodal biometric system. As you can see in this particular cartoon, uh, the face recognition software will not be able to identify anybody in this company. They all look the same. So what can we do? Even if everybody looks exactly the same, or if the image of the face is poor, we can use another biometric such as voice or gait or gesture in order to identify a person. Uh, in fact, we just started a collaborative research with uh, smart technology uh, that allow us in the <coughs> meeting room to identify and look at the contribution of the participant add the body language, add the gestures that they make to see who is a, a leading contributor, how people communicate to each other, how effective the meeting is run. And all of this can be picked up from those context-based auxiliary behavioral biometric traits and from um, combining those biometrics together. So here is an exact difference between single multimodal biometric systems, the single biometric system architecture shown to the right. We have feature extraction, feature matching, and get the final result. In multimodal, we have a number of different biometrics. The question becomes is what goes into this information fusion module. Before information fusion made its way about seven years ago into biometric research, and we were some of the first to, to uh, start working on it, and. Um, I had a fairly 
uh, well-cited paper in IEEE, uh, transactions on system and cybernetics and transducing multi-model rank level fusion uh, to the biometric research. This was very typically used in two domains. One is medical and another is uh, customer profiling, profiling and finance and banking. In medical domain, there's multiple uh, symptoms and one has to come up with a single diagnosis. And in customer profiling and banking, in banking, in retail domain, there's multiple factor that can play a uh, significant part in understanding the um, ways how consumer works, whether he's going to become a customer, whether he's going to make a purchase. And those factors at the end was going to say you if this person is going to make the purchase or not, yes or no. And uh, aside from that, there's some other domains where information fusion decision making is, of course, being used, but it's became very, very prominent um, direction of biometric research but, uh, in the past five years and right now the number of uh, different systems, multi-biometric systems increased significantly. So the single uh, biometric system faced numerous limitations uh, that we discussed. Uh, the quality of the sample, orientation, rotation, distortion, noise, intracross variability, non-universality, non-distinctness makes uh, it sometimes hard for it to achieve very, very high results. This has been well accepted and well known fact right now in biometric domain. And the number of advantages of multi uh, biometric system A, they can offer substantial improvement in the matching accuracy, uh, B, they can address issue of non universality on uh, insufficient population coverage on one of the single biometric, on some of the data biometric traits by compensating using another. And third, this final one makes uh, life of imposter harder, so make it much harder to. Um, facilitate challenge response mechanism uh, by when user uh, or imposter tries to present random subset of different traits. Uh, so coming again to the same image, we can now solve this problem of people looking exactly identical. Uh, we can uh, solve the problem that it makes it much harder for the intruder to um, break into the system because he needs to provide much more information to the system. And the final one, it also can be viewed as a fault tolerance system and this particular uh, image is a real Intel surfboard that was created. And uh, I guess the only thing, I mean, you can do anything. You can send an email, you can text, you can browse internet, upload yourself if you want to. But if you fall over the board, it's not becoming fault tolerant anymore. You can't operate it. And so the multimodal system kind of gives you this cushion that even if you fail at one biometric, it's, you're not going to fail at another. So now, uh, going through this information fusion, coming back to this most important um, module, information fusion, how can it be done? So first of all, there's a whole bunch of different uh, sources of multiple evidence. So we can have multi-sensor systems with different uh, optical or solid sensors. We can have a number of different algorithms we can apply to the same database. We can have multi-instance right and left eye. We can have uh, more samples for the, in this particular case, facial expressions. And then we can just have uh, what most of the people understand as truly multimodal system, different types of biometrics. And it can be also combined in the hybrid systems. So there are various fusion level possibilities, and essentially this is a very interesting diagram because uh, the levels of the data processing go left to right. So on the very left of this image, of this diagram, you will see that uh, we have a raw data, then we have features extracted, then we have a uh, first decision, which is going to match initial images, so we're going to get match score or make match rank obtained by the system and the last one we simply have one decision yes or no so going from the left from potentially it's a multi-dimensional data space to the very right it's binary space yes or no we can apply uh, different fusions at different levels and the very first one's called sensor level fusion the next one feature level in the next one it's major score length fusion the first last one decision level the algorithms to make this decision become easier as we go to the right, but the precision also drops. So there is a fine balance 
And while the spectrum of those algorithms exist, norm, uh, most of the people work within either feature level fusion, image score rank level fusion, or even sometimes decision level fusion. And um, essentially, as we look at a little bit more complex structure now with multimodal biometric system, this particular case, we have an enrollment. Uh, in this is one of the first systems that we developed for phase era and iris processing. We have a system database which stores phase era and iris templates. Uh, then we have started, uh, after we extract the features, uh, various types of rank level fusion, high, um, high strength border count, logistic regression, Markov chain, and we also introduced, aside from those Markov chain, we introduced the fuzzy fusion to the mix, and fuzzy fusion means that uh, decision is not binary anymore as a life. It's not just uh, black or white. It has all the colors and shades of gray, and we're dealing and working up with all the colors and shades of gray uh, with the probability of uh, sample being good, with probability of our decision being good, with probability of our algorithm being acceptable, that we can all measure and rank in the degree from 0 to 100. And when we combine it using uh, sp uh, special fuzzy system rules, we can get to different degrees of also confidence in our result. And uh, this is what we call confidence-based uh, biometric system, confidence-based fusion. And we can see that normally, uh, once again, what our research showed that using multimodal biometric system, uh, if we're looking at uh, RSC curve shown right here, um, any of those techniques, logistic ring and border count, high strength, will get much higher result. But if we combine it with some other techniques, such as Markov chain, weighted majority voting, we're going to get even better results. I'm going to leave you with just a couple of um, pictures of our count research uh, related to online security. So we have the whole, we can apply the same principles and the same ideas and techniques and methods of using machine intelligence, cognitive system design, fuzzy logic, multimodal system to online world as well. And in this particular case, we identify industrial personal robots, virtual world avatars, non-biological agents in the RT metrics and its extension of biometrics. We can use uh, similar techniques. Our own collection of robot data, such as chat logs, synthetics, voice recording, game strategy logs, etc., etc., behavior, appearance, environment where those uh, avatars existed. For avatar recognition, we use the same knowledge based method, feature invariant approaches, template matching techniques, and uh, um, hidden Markov model neural network SVM machines to learn about those methods, and we also can combine emotion recognition, which is going to be expressed itself through the chat, through the text, and through the visual uh, patterns. And um, what we are going to go through next is uh, there's uh, gives the rise of the term which um, I called uh, physio-emotional um, symmetrics. So together, behavioral physiological automation in the virtual world can be utilized as part of physio-emotional symmetric system, which is yet to be developed. Uh, finally, the very current research that uh, we discussed with some of the members of the Pur Purdue University uh, security domain was on uh, social biometrics, and we can create a, a social network using tweets. Uh, in this particular case, we have URL, reply, retweet, and, retweet and hashtag networks uh, create a special network similarity threshold and get the final similarity score which allows us to compare how all of these emerging biometrics, such as Twitter biometric, can be used as a social biometric to identify people. Future research directions that we're moving on, social biometrics, using image processing method for avatar recognition, behavioral context-based auxiliary biometrics, machine learning, cybersecurity, normal versus abnormal prediction patterns, cognitive methods, biometrics, and cancelable biometrics, and to learn more you can send me email, you can Google me uh, on the website or go to Biometric Technologies Lab. Uh, there is, was a feature National Museum of Civilization in 2011-12 about uh, Biometric Technology Lab, um, Science Daily and uh, BBC News and Discovery Channel did some features as well and it's all linked to through my website. So on that I will stop my presentation. I think I used exactly one hour of my allowed time. So thank you.
Two minutes to spare. Two minutes to spare, yes. I can spare two minutes. So I'm completely open for the questions right now and all the... And there's a lot to take in, but usually get tons of questions. Um, I remember uh, maybe a good 10, 15 years ago, uh, one of my father's uh, PhD students was working on fingerprints and cataracts. He dealt with that. And uh, uh, I was told maybe I was understood that at that time, with the resolution that was available, no more than 300 types of fingerprints uh, would be discerned. So uh, I was uh, no, shocked to hear yeah. because that meant that there is a million people in this country. There were way larger databases. Yeah, that is, that, is, that is different right now. There are way larger databases. There's tons of different sensors that can acquire fingerprints uh, using optic and ink based and even they can be acquired right now remotely as you know by based on the te temperature or the uh, flow of the blood underneath the fingerprint and based on the moisture that can be detected either by touching or remotely so there's tons of technology went down from those devices 15 years ago costing over a thousand dollars to them costing 20 bucks you you know if we put them on the locks on the displays on the cell phones and uh, with the very high resolution, uh, it's um, also the recognition rate went quite significantly up. So you can get it based on the fingerprint considered to be one of the, first of all, uh, very unique uh, patterns. I, I believe I've been asked this question a number of times, but the uh, siblings that I, I look identically would have different fingerprints. So they can be even identified like that. And uh, it's um, it's the recognition rate is definitely above 90 percent maybe above 95 percent for most of the technologies so this is considered to be somewhat a resolved, solved problem in the biometric domain right now it's an individual task but it's definitely this is why it's one of the most acceptable technologies it's it's used everywhere because it can identify you uniquely so it's part of the biometric passwords for a number of countries Different types, there are five different types based on topology. There are also three different types of algorithms based on what we're looking for. We can look at minutiae uh, um, identification, we can look at the ridges and valleys in the fingerprint, and then we can look at uh, temperature and the um, other parameters, like physical parameters of the fingerprint and pick it up. And in terms of the, there's even a model exists um, uh, which is um, uh, the physics-based Newton uh, attraction model that can model ears and fingerprints as well based on the physical principle of particles being attracted to each other in these sizes. So it's, there's, it's been really well researched and been very, very successful. And face, face biometric almost gets uh, to be as good as that. But this is if we talk about individual biometric nodes, the whole uh, direction where the field is going. Any other questions or comments? Yep, thanks. How much of these change over age with any significance? Yes, it's huge. It's, um, it, it, it's one of the directions of research within the face recognition uh, domain, and it has implications to uh, customer profiling, uh, updating the uh, database of employers. Uh, it has implications for emotion recognition, reaction of the people to stress, or to unusual environments, and obviously to for the security of normal versus abnormal um, identification behavior in the lie detective test in a stressful situations. So it has um, wide, like all of those, a wide range of applications from social sciences to security domain, and um, it's considered to be unsolved problem. We can model how very well in animations and in uh, Pixar studios. We can model beautifully how. Uh, using uh, non-realistic uh, rendering or photorealistic rendering, uh, we can model how people change, how they age, how they react to surrounding, how they express emotions. But when we need to recognize a person, the key is right now to have large number of um, samples, uh, create very nice learning 
uh, feature set that is independent of emotion expressed can use that to identify the person. But when we try to look for differences, not similarities, we're going to find that everybody expresses emotion in a very unique way. And there's a number of different theories exist that actually look at whether we can look at the muscle movements or we can look at the uh, overall you know, expression that the face transposes or we, there's even research using EEG signals and the facial expression and effect of the smell, the noise, the, the sound that you have on the behavior of the brain and we can look at the, what happens in the brain when we have those expressions. So it's actually very interesting that it's quite not well studied. Yes. Uh, how do scientists working in this field uh, approach the problem of privacy? Yes. It's a fantastic question. So, uh, there are a number of regulations that all of us scientists working in this particular field has to follow. For instance, you cannot collect or use any data without um, ethics approval being obtained. Uh, there are um, <clears throat> other things that you uh, cannot do. So there's a number of studies are uh, prohibited or not allowed or will never go ahead because of they being either controversial or too invasive to the privacy, etc. Unlike that, um, or at least understanding in the field that if there's a public data, it normally can be mined. It can be transposed, it can be studied, it can be taken, it can be researched. And companies do it, large companies do it, and uh, organizations do it for their own purposes. And if something is essentially available publicly for anybody to see, it's not protected at the moment by any law for to be studied, researched, and mined. Uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, very quickly, I've been to the Stanford uh, University conference where uh, one of the researchers just pulled out the profile, public profile of two of his colleagues uh, on the um, research gate or available on LinkedIn or Google Scholar and was talking about them because these are public profiles and you can analyze them and talk about it. It's not nice, but you cannot protect your privacy if it's public information. So if you want to keep something, and we discussed that European Commission has much stricter rules and laws that will protect human privacy. For instance, you have a right to a request to be removed from the database, request to be removed from certain listings, request to be re removed from phone you know, companies' books there, and they have to oblige. If not, you can go and sue the company or employer, and we're still ways away from it here. But it's definitely, there's much more emphasis on it, and there are people working in this area. At Purdue, as you probably know, there is the IRB, a review board. And if you don't have uh, permission for a very detailed uh, proposal, uh, you cannot do yeah. mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you.